This happened quite a while ago. I don't know why I decided to talk about this publicly now, but it's probably because it's rainy season, just like it was when this happened. A few years ago, as a high school student, I rebelled against my parents and chose a university in a neighbouring prefecture. The reason why I chose this area was because my paternal grandfather's house, which was near the university, was deserted. I basically wanted to enjoy living alone at a cheap price. It's not like someone died and it's haunted or anything. No one was living in it because my grandparents bought a house in Okinawa and moved there when I was in elementary school. And I've got zero psychic abilities. Even if a ghost were to whisper something right next to me, I probably wouldn't notice. In fact, there was a time when all my friends told me that there was a bloody woman floating mid-air in the schoolyard. Apparently, only the right side of her body was covered in blood. I thought it was a joke until they all started crying. So anyway, my childhood memories of my grandfather's house was that it was pretty luxurious and built in a hill by the river. It was breezy and spacious and it seemed like the perfect place to live alone. My parents were reluctant to let me go, but they eventually gave me permission and my grandparents readily agreed. I took a few of my personal belongings along with an old cat that belonged to my grandparents on my mother's side and made my way to my new home sweet home. Since I was attending a university in a prefecture outside of where I grew up, I had zero friends and it was quite a struggle for a few days. Whenever I got back, I would go to the third floor, lie down on the futon spread out under the large round glass window and immediately fall asleep. This routine continued for a while and when I was finally getting used to this stage in life, I began to notice that the cat was acting strange. The house had four floors, including the basement, and had a kitchen, a toilet, and a bathroom on every floor. The guest room had its own bath, so I rarely spent time on any floor other than the entrance and the third floor. I would catch the cat carefully checking the boundaries of the house and it would stare off into places where there was seemingly nothing. It would then slip out through the open window only to come back sometime later. I didn't think anything of it. Cats are peculiar creatures after all. According to my mum and grandmother, this cat was a stray kitten that was rescued when its mother died. This is all to say that I wasn't concerned about its behaviour at all. In fact, I wouldn't have cared even if the house was filled with vengeful spirits. One day, I picked up a rare mobile phone by the river. It was an ancient model. Many middle schoolers have their own phones these days, but back in those days, and especially in such a rural area, it was something that you could barely afford to have until you were a university student. When I say it was an old model, I mean it. It didn't even have a camera on it yet. It was filthy with the paint peeling off in places and there were weeds entangled in it. I cocked my head to the side, pressed the button to turn it on and wondered how it ended up by the river. As expected, it didn't turn on and the display remained black, so I turned it over and took out the battery and when I did, a bit of water trickled out. I thought it might have shorted out but I wanted to at least get the phone book data to its rightful owner. I figured if someone had used such an old model until the paint was peeling and to the point where it looked this dirty, that it must have been quite important to them. So I decided to take it home to charge it. Because the phone was a different model to mine, I drove 10 minutes to the nearest convenience store and bought a charger. I don't really know why I bothered to go to such lengths, but I somehow felt like I needed to. The sun had gone down by the time I got home. After making dinner and taking a bath, I remembered about the phone and went to grab it from the entrance. The kind of joy I felt when I saw the red light turn on after plugging in the charger was indescribable. It may sound self-righteous, but the belief that I could possibly help someone, even if just a little, filled me with a sense of elation as if I had done some incredible deed. There was also a hidden desire to be admired and appreciated without going through the police. I wanted to see the owner's face and hear his or her words of gratitude when I handed the phone over to them. I guess the fact that I was still pretty young back then led me to feel this way. Anyway, I absentmindedly opened the phone as it continued to charge. 
My right index finger, which I had placed on the red light in order to block it, turned blood red. I pressed my thumb down on the power button and I remember my left hand resting on the display. The 10 odd seconds it took for it to start up felt a lot longer. Even as I write this, I can still vividly feel the tingling sensation on my entire body when it finally turned on. The number of unsent emails on the screen was abnormal, as were the number of outgoing calls. The moment the little three reception bars at the top of the screen lit up, the phone flew out of my hand and started vibrating on the floor. I'm assuming the numbers displayed on the screen went above its maximum threshold. I looked around. No one else was in this big house other than myself, and the only thing moving around was the phone that was laying on the floor, vibrating. And yet, I was so sure that I could hear someone or something else scratching the floor. I strained my ears to single out the sound, but it stopped shortly after, and the phone also stopped vibrating. Thrust into sudden silence again, a sense of panic began at the pit of my stomach. I quickly pulled out my phone and called the police. The line connected and I heard the dial tone, but the police, who would normally pick up immediately, didn't answer. I stayed on the line, listening to the dial tone, hoping that they'd hurry and pick up the phone. Then, the phone on the floor suddenly began to vibrate again. Somebody was calling it. It scraped against the floor, slowly moving from the vibration. It almost felt like it was trying to come closer. No, it was definitely slowly making its way towards me. The charging cable, which was coiled up at the beginning, had now become taut. It continued to pull, and with a snap, it disconnected from the phone. I was watching silently as I gripped the phone tighter, listening to the phone still ringing against my ears, still waiting for the police to pick up. I almost got a surreal sensation that I was somehow calling that other phone, which was now vibrating across the floor. I know I could have easily looked at my phone screen to see whether I was actually calling the police, but I couldn't. I was paralyzed. My eyes were glued to the phone that was steadily getting closer and I felt like something was standing right behind me. Something that looked like the bloody woman my friends all saw at school. After some time, the phone suddenly stopped just a couple of inches from my feet. And then I realized that it didn't stop because the call was disconnected, but because it was actually answered. I knew as much because I began to hear a gurgling sound, the kind of sound water makes when you unplug a bathtub. A sudden high-pitched woman's screech blared out of it, as well as loud metallic banging noises. A few seconds later, my cat appeared and pounced onto it as if it was catching an insect. He stepped on the hang-up button as he did so, and the phone went silent. I collapsed onto the floor as if someone yanked all the energy from me, and then I heard the echoing voice of the police in my ears. I scooped the cat up in my arms and I ran to the nearest police station to hand the creepy phone in. A few days later, the police visited me. Apparently, in an underground sewer running below the road in front of my house, a woman's skeletonized body was discovered handcuffed to an iron grate near the drainage pipes connecting to the river. The woman had gone missing a few years before but was never found and her parents, not giving up on her, had continued to pay her phone contract in hopes that it might lead to her whereabouts one day. The obvious question the police had for me was how the phone came to be in my hands. I went back to the station with them where I told them what had happened, exactly as I had written for you guys so far, and they immediately released me. Apparently, the woman was taken underground long after my grandfather's house was built, and ordinary people did not have access to the sewers. The police also told me unofficially at the station that they found unsent messages that seemed to include the suspect's name. It was also discovered that all the unsent messages had been sent from a different prefecture and that the dates spanned the past three years. When I got home, I walked down to the basement. My phone had three bars. I put my cheek against the wall. If someone else was in this house, 
if my phone was the same kind as hers. My imagination started to run wild. Three years of someone trying to send out messages and the sounds I heard coming from that phone. The temperature suddenly dropped and I fled the basement as quickly as I could. Someone asked a question in the comments. It said, how did the phone battery last for three years? To which the author replies, if you think about it, there's no way the battery would have stayed alive for three years, not to mention it was probably in the drainage pipes, so there would have been a lot of water damage. I forgot to mention before, but the police told me that when I handed over the phone, they couldn't get it to turn on. All the information they found was through its memory card, or something like that. They couldn't find a record of any incoming calls for that night either, so I don't know who or what called me when I was in my room. The few years that the phone was apparently in a different prefecture until I took it to the police station, I can't help but feel like it was in some different realm during those years. Have you ever experienced something when you were younger, but you didn't understand what it all meant until a few years later when you were older and a bit wiser? I have, and this is my story. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. When I was in elementary school, the road I used to commute to school was a country road surrounded by rice fields. There was a deserted mannequin factory along the way and a candy store further ahead. There were only a few houses scattered across the fields and I think the factory had been abandoned for quite some time because I'd never seen a single person working there. You could see dismembered mannequin parts piled into several heaps from the fence. It was intriguing and hella creepy at the same time. Wide gutters surrounded the site and it emitted a terrible odour because the water in it had gone off. People had also thrown a bunch of trash into it over the years so the water was black and sludgy and just looked horrible. One day I took a detour and went to the back of the factory that I don't usually go to. The condition of the gutters was far worse on that side. I was looking into it when I saw a female mannequin with half of its body floating among the garbage. It was pale white and stuck out like a sore thumb in the midst of all this trash. I thought about pulling it out and taking it to mine and my friend's secret hangout area. I was pretty sure my friends would be happy to have a mascot. But looking down at the surrounding water and the distance I'd have to go to get the mannequin, I gave up. In case one of my friends were braver than me and decided to go get the mannequin themselves, I decided to keep it my little secret. I didn't want anyone to steal my thunder. After this day, it became my daily routine to go and check on the mannequin after school. Unfortunately for me though, it began to disintegrate in front of my eyes, day by day. It had only been a few days when its white surface became dirty and discolored and looked nothing like it had when I'd first found it. Eventually, its lush hair fell out in clumps. Dark patches emerged on its surface and it became swollen and bumpy all over. It even looked like some animal had gotten to it and chewed on parts of it. It began to sink deeper into the blackened water and at the end, the last bit that was still poking out of the surface looked like it had absorbed the surrounding liquid and was bloated to the max. It had become one with all the surrounding trash and I had lost all interest in it. A few days after that though, I became curious again and went to go check on it, but it was no longer there. Once I graduated elementary school, I didn't pass the same road anymore. And during summer vacation of my third year of high school, I decided to bike around the area for old time's sake. The scenery had completely changed. A residential neighborhood had been built over the rice fields and the mannequin factory had turned into a parking lot. And then I had a flashback of that mannequin. Shit, I thought, and the hairs on my arms stood. Does plastic decay like that? Being a high schooler, at this point, I'd seen many gory images, and I couldn't shake the feeling that what I thought was a mannequin when I was younger was actually a real person. A dead body, as a matter of fact. I can't be sure but I most likely witnessed it slowly decomposing. 
And because I didn't share this little secret with anyone else back then, it remains a creepy memory that I have that I can't talk to anyone else about. The incident seemed to have occurred in the early 1990s. It took place in a two-story house on the outskirts of an old residential area in the mountains in the northern part of F-City, where we currently live. A certain couple and their only son lived in that house. The father was a university professor and his son's name was Shintaro. From an early age, it was clear that Shintaro had certain mental delays and would exhibit abnormal and strange behavior. His parents therefore decided to homeschool him. Neighbors who knew Shintaro back then were frightened by his eccentric behavior. By the time he was around 13 or 14 years old, he was already 180 centimeters or 5 foot 10. He always wore a tight striped t-shirt with shorts and made strange noises shouting at people passing by as he walked along the streets. He sometimes became violent and threw rocks at people, chased them and punched them, and finally, he would brutally kill the neighborhood's beloved household pets. His parents therefore did everything they could to keep him from leaving the house. Shintaro, who was spending more time at home, gradually became more violent towards his parents, and finally, at the age of 16, killed them in their home. His reason to kill them was apparently because his mother entered his room without permission and threw away one of his cherished figurines. Since he was a minor when the police arrested him, he was subsequently admitted to a state correctional facility. After saying all this, Fujiki, who was driving, glanced sideways at his girlfriend Manami, who was sitting in the passenger seat, then looked in the rearview mirror at his friends Kurasaki and Horie. The four classmates from the same university were into the occult, and one Sunday in early winter, they were heading to an abandoned house in Fujiki's car. He was a slightly overweight man who loved cars and anime. Horie, a large man with a beard, was a strong athlete who played rugby in middle and high school. He said, So, are we going to go explore the house where Shintaro lived? Bingo, Fujiki said, giving a thumbs up. Kurasaki, a fair-skinned and lanky guy, and the most scared of the four, asked. If the kid was 16 when he killed his parents and was put in a correctional facility in the early 90s, he's probably in his 40s now. I wonder if he's still in there. Fujiki's girlfriend Manami turned around and replied. I doubt it. He's probably back in society and living amongst us somewhere. Manami had short brown hair and was petite and looked like the shy type but she actually had a pretty strong character. Kurasaki didn't like what she said and responded that a situation like that would be way too dangerous for others. Just then, Fujiki said, Actually, there's a couple of rumors about what happened to him. One says that he committed suicide while he was in the facility, so his spirit might be haunting the house he lived in, while another one says that he escaped a few years after he got caught and he still goes to visit his house from time to time. Horia piped in. Dude, how do you know about all this stuff? My dad's younger brother, so my uncle, actually lives in a house close to where Shintaro used to live. All my relatives gathered at the temple for my grandfather's memorial service the other day and he was talking about it. Uh-huh. So if that's the case... Maybe Shintaro will be there when we visit his abandoned house. The four continued discussing the matter as the car approached the entrance of the old residential area. A mountain was basically demolished to build up this area and it was lined with identical two-story houses. According to my uncle, the house in question is located on a small hill through this residential area. The car crept down the street between the rows of the old houses. It was already past 3 p.m. and the sky was overcast with thin clouds. Eventually, the car exited the residential area. Fujiki stopped it on the side of the road, checked his surroundings again and pointed ahead. It's over there. I think the house is near the top of that hill, he said, and began driving again. After climbing the gently sloping road surrounded by weeds, they came to a flat area of gravel. The car came to a halt. 
About 100 meters in front of the car, there was a two-story house surrounded by trees. I think it's that one. Fujiki turned off the engine and got out of the car. The other three also got out, and with Fujiki in the lead, they started walking towards their target house. As they walked through the woods, an old two-story house appeared. The rusted iron gate was unlocked, and Fujiki opened it with both hands. They made their way past the narrow weed-filled path to the entrance. There was graffiti on the white door. It said in bright red letters, Danger. Do not enter. Seems like we're not the first ones, Horia grinned as he grabbed the doorknob. As you might have guessed, the door wasn't locked. Ow! Manami yelped. What's wrong? Kurasaki asked Manami, who was now bent down and cradling her head. I think someone threw a rock at me or something. A rock? Fujiki looked around, but no one else was there and nothing was out of the ordinary, and he helped her to her feet. After making sure she was all right, Horia opened the front door. A musty smell suddenly filled everyone's nostrils. A hallway stretched out from the entrance, and there were doors that lined both sides of it. The stairs that led up to the second floor was next to the door at the very end of the hallway. It's not as trashed as I thought it would be, said Fujiki as he stepped into the house, followed by the other three. They began to open each door as they moved further into the house. The first door was the bath and shower and the toilet was next to it. Across from this was what looked to be a study. There was a pretty solid desk and a bookshelf lining one side of the wall. It was packed tight with various books. This room obviously belonged to the father, who was a university professor. Kurosaki wondered out loud how an intellectual person could have fathered such a troubled son. You know what they say, said Horie. There's a fine line between genius and insanity. A door somewhere suddenly slammed shut. All four of them turned around at once. They could hear someone laughing and running down the hallway. Horie quickly walked to the door, opened it and peered out. There's no one there, he said. Manami said, Guys, maybe Shintaro's here. I think we should leave. Don't be ridiculous. It's probably some kid from around the neighborhood playing a prank on us, replied Fujiki. After checking all the rooms on the first floor, the four of them were finally at the stairs and started climbing up with Fujiki leading the way. Each step creaked and echoed eerily through the house. The second floor seemed to have the same floor plan with several doors along the hallway. They opened and checked each room one by one, just like before. A toilet, a bleak Japanese style room, a bedroom that looked like it had been used by the parents. And now they were finally at the last door. Fujiki turned the knob and slowly opened it. The first thing that jumped into everyone's eyes were the iron bars that had been set up to block the entrance. After the initial shock and surprise, they looked through the bars and into the room. There was a study desk by the front window and a bed by the wall on the right. The shelf covering the left wall had countless figurines displayed on it. Fujiki whispered, This must have been Shintaro's room. Let's get out of here, guys. We've seen everything in this house said Kurasaki nervously. How can we turn back now after coming this far? replied Horie. He crouched down and found that he could open the bottom half of the bars and crawled into the room. Everyone followed him in. At first glance, the room looked like any ordinary child's room. Everything except for the shelf. The four of them stood next to each other, looking at all the figurines. There were numerous anime female characters in various poses lined up along it. Holy shit, this is amazing. How many do you think there are? Fujiki picked one up, looked at it carefully, and Kurasaki started counting them. There were probably a lot more here before, said Horie, and Shintaro went crazy when his mother accidentally threw one away when she was cleaning his room or something. Manami replied, First of all, can't understand how anyone could get that pissed off because a toy figurine was thrown away, and second, kill someone over it. Anyway, we should get going. It's starting to get dark out. She looked over at the window. 
it was true. The light seeping through the curtains had gotten weaker. The rest all agreed that it was a good idea and turned to head out the room when Manami said, Wait, wait, wait. I can hear something. They all closed their mouths to listen. The stairs were making creaking noises as if someone was coming up to the second floor. Rasaki started freaking out and they began whispering to one another urgently. Mama? Mama? A childlike voice echoed at the far end of the hall followed by a knocking sound. Whoever the kid was was knocking on the first door. They heard the door opening and then... Mama? Where are you? They heard the first door close and the voice proceeding to the next door down. Whoever this was was slowly making his way down the hallway and would eventually reach Shintaro's bedroom. Horie, the strongest of them all, quickly went to the window, picked up the desk and quietly placed it down in front of the door. He then put the chair on top. While he was doing that, the other three were panicking, saying that it was Shintaro who was coming down the hall. After figuring out what Horia was intending to do, Manami walked to the window and opened it while Fujiki grabbed the bed sheets. They were going to try to escape out the window. The three men grabbed one of the sheets and Manami climbed out the window first and safely jumped down into the weeds next to the entrance. Next, as Kurasaki was trying to get out the window, the voice finally came from just outside the bedroom door. Mama, are you in there? Fujiki and Horie stared nervously at the entrance to the room. The doorknob turned, clicked, and it opened. The two of them instantly felt chills down their spines when they saw who was on the other side. The man was so tall that he was almost touching the ceiling. He was wearing a tight striped t-shirt and shorts, a clear mismatch to his huge frame. The man gripped the iron gate with both hands and yelled out, Hey! Are you guys stealing my figurines? He looked like he was about to cry and began to try to open the bottom half of the grate, but the desk and the chair was making that difficult. After checking that Kurasaki had landed on the ground, it was Horie's turn. He went down as quickly as he could, and just as Fujiki climbed out onto the window's ledge, the man came into the room. He came at Fujiki, crying and demanding him to give back the figurines. Fujiki couldn't take the time to climb down, so breathing in deeply, he jumped from the second floor onto the ground below. A sharp pain shot up his legs and the three helped carry Fujiki back to the car as fast as they could. Manami jumped into the driver's seat and they peeled away. By the time they got back to the city, it was completely dark out. They drove directly to the emergency room and sure enough, Fujiki had broken both his legs after jumping from Shintaro's bedroom window. He immediately went into surgery and was hospitalized. A week went by. Fujiki was still in the hospital in a private room and bored out of his mind. Both of his legs were still wrapped up in bandages. Manami had come to visit him in the afternoon and they were having a chat when she asked. So, do you think the guy you saw was Shintaro? Fujiki looked off into the distance for a while before answering. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was something else. Something that no longer belongs in this world. He then closed his eyes and eventually fell asleep. When he woke up from his nap, Manami was gone. He ate the dinner that the nurse brought in and began reading a book. He couldn't concentrate. He put it down and reached over to the table to his right, opened the drawer and pulled out something from inside. It was a female anime figurine that he had stolen from the house. Fujiki had liked that character when he was in high school and he couldn't help but pocket it when he saw it. He looked at it with satisfaction for a while and eventually fell back asleep. It was time for lights out and the lights out in the hallway were dimmed and the one in the room was also turned off. Somewhere deep in his sleep, he heard a child's voice. Mama? Mama? Where are you? Give me back my figurine. Was this a nightmare? Fujiki slowly opened his eyes and sat up in bed. He let out a sigh as the voice disappeared. His heart was beating fast and he was sweating. It trickled down his face and finally dripped off his chin and onto his hospital gown. 
He looked around the room as he began to calm down and froze when his eyes got to the door. It was wide open, and someone was standing there. He could only see a silhouette because the lights were off, but it was easy to see that the thing standing there was so tall that it was almost touching the ceiling. 